welcome to I Care Better, Endo Unplugged, where we talk about all things endometriosis. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller, pelvic floor and physical therapist and integrative nutritionist. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Anna Artiaga Biggs. She is a compassionate and experienced licensed clinical psychologist practicing in San Diego. She is dedicated to helping individuals, couples, and families overcome stress, anxiety, and depression. She specializes in trauma and post-traumatic growth. She guides her patients towards transformative changes in their moods, thoughts, behaviors, and relationships. In addition to her clinical work, Anna serves as a trusted supervisor and consultant. She holds a PsyD in clinical psychology from the PGSP Stanford PsyD Consortium, receiving training at both Stanford University School of Medicine and Palo Alto University. Her expertise extends to a wide range of areas, including chronic medical conditions, grief, racial identity development, destructive mind control, couples and family therapy, infertility, and women's health. She also facilitates support groups, further enhancing her commitment to fostering healing and growth in diverse communities. As a National Register Health Servant Psychologist, Anna upholds the highest professional standards in her practice. She also has her own journey with endometriosis, which she's going to share with us today. She's currently five days out from surgery, and we're so honored to have her talking with us today and sharing her story while everything is so fresh. Well, welcome. How are you feeling? Oh, um, I feel oddly far better than I could imagine feeling. I I think that I went into this surgery, um, so I should say I had uh, excision surgery, uh, you know, via... Uh, da Vinci laparoscopy, robotic laparoscopy. And then I also had a hysterectomy um, on Wednesday. (laughs) So I think I went into that thinking um, that that was going to be a long, very long healing process. And in some ways it will be sort of, I I think in other other areas and other ways. But um, as far as pain, my pain level, I was expecting it to be pretty intolerable, but I'm finding that this pain is far more tolerable than my normal endo and adenomyosis pain. Um, So that's been really interesting. And then a lot of other pain that I was previously experiencing, I'm no longer experiencing at all. And now I just have this kind of, you know, surgery pain, um, which feels fine because I know that I know why it's there and I know that it's temporary, right? So then psychologically, it just has a totally different impact on me than my previous pain. So I hope that makes sense what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. I think you hit on kind of a key topic that a lot of people will mention is, is the knowing, right. And the expectations I think for so long, and probably you'll get into this a little bit too, for your story, there was probably so many years of not understanding why you're in pain, why you're experiencing this or that. Even when things are, you know, trying to be addressed, for example, we talked a little bit about the hip pain and trying in PT to really address that and not really getting anywhere. And all of a sudden, you know, at least for now, um, it's been gone. But I think knowing, oh, yes, I just had surgery and therefore there's some pain that seems relevant and there's a reason for it really does help psychologically, like you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, it's purposeful yeah, pain, so, right? like purposeful pain, like labor and things like that. As hard as they can be, you can withstand them more because you sort of know there's hopefully, right, like a reward at the end of it um, or, you know, it's going to just last for this many days or hours or whatever the case and then it'll be over. Um, whereas the other pain has been, yeah, so many years and no answers and a lot of frustration um, to say the least. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And can you share with us a little bit about your journey and how you found out about endometriosis and what some of the turning points were for you in getting a diagnosis? Sure. Um, It's always hard when you try to fit these stories right into a one hour podcast, because really, I probably need, you know, eight days to just share with you everything that I've sort of gone through in terms of trying to get answers, but I'll give you the Cliff's Notes of the Cliff's Notes and feel free to cut me off at any point that I'm sort of rambling. But um, I think really my story started a lot longer than I realized and sort of as I have kind of come onto this side of things, I'm starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So things from when I was 13 
they didn't they didn't feel related that, that they were related um, until most recently where now I'm, I'm recognizing, yeah, that was all part of this. And I just didn't know it. And my doctors didn't know it more importantly. Um, but as far as the word endometriosis, it first came into my awareness um, when I was a postdoctoral fellow. So I was a postdoctoral fellow in women's health um, and behavioral medicine, which meant that I did consult liaison for a hospital um, where I was like the, the psychological consultant that would be called by the medical staff in the hospital and even outpatient as well, anything related to women's health specifically. So this could be pregnant postpartum women, this could be antepartum, this could be gyne-onc, this could be breast cancer, I mean, literally anything um, in within the hospital setting. And so I first started seeing all these cases of women with endometriosis, and this was poverty medicine. So these were, um, you know, people who did not have access to specialists and all, you know, um, kind of a lot. They, they, many of them did not have access to, you know, higher education and things like that. A lot of them were monolingual Spanish speakers and they were undocumented, um, And, you know, predominantly, I feel like I served, you know, women of color. So um, I think that that's an important part of all of this as well. Um, And I'll speak more to that, just the level of racism that I encountered, especially in this setting, but just even in my own care. Um, It's when I I feel like my eyes were first really open to that in a meaningful way. Um, So I would see these women and they were suffering and suffering and suffering. And then the doctors would call me, the medical doctors, and they'd say, all right, I have a patient here. I don't really know what to do with this person anymore. They're still saying they're in pain. We want you to come up and let us know, like, are they drug seeking or do they just need therapy because they don't know how to manage their anxiety? And so, you know, I would go up there and I would talk to these women and they were truly suffering. And I... I felt helpless because I didn't, you know, they were telling me like something's seriously wrong with my body, but I was hearing these medical doctors tell me, no, they're, they're totally fine. We did their surgery. They're just being ridiculous essentially. And they would, you could tell that there was either a profound annoyance and frustration or almost like a hopelessness from some of these doctors. Cause remember some of these were residents, you know, they weren't all, you know, attendings that were, you know, seasoned doctors. Some of these people were pretty new And I think that they were, you know, they were just doing what they were learning what to do, you know, what they had learned what to do. And it wasn't working, but they didn't know that it wasn't working. They were doing what they thought is the treatment. And that treatment is not, it's not a good treatment, right? They were probably doing ablation. A lot of times they were accidentally hitting other organs um, and uh, creating more problems and I just saw a lot of really terrible things during that time. And what I started to do was recognize some of these symptoms in myself. And I, when I looked more into endometriosis, I thought, well, I have that, I have that, I have that. I sort of look at the checklist. I'm like, ah, uh, <laughs> I hit all, you know, the, the, the boxes here. That's a little scary. So when I went to navigate getting my own care, I went to, you know, these women's health clinics throughout Los Angeles and Um, I was met with a lot of, no, this is just anxiety. This is your menses. You know, I'd look at my, my notes and my notes would essentially deny everything that I'd claimed was painful. It was like patient denied, you know, pain with sex, patient denied, um, you know, pelvic pain in general, all these things that I was like, no, I'm pretty sure I said that I have like severe pain in all of these areas. And it was just, you know, really attributed to basically, I'm just this anxious person and I just have, you know, periods and I need to kind of get over it because I'm a woman. Um, and so I was really discouraged thinking, okay, yeah, I mean, I am an, I, you know, I am, I do have anxiety. And I think the, the piece of the puzzle here that's a little bit trickier for me specifically is that within my own family, there's kind of jokes about me that I'm like this hypochondriac, right? Um, and ever since I was really little, you know, I would say things like, I, you know, I hurt my finger and I can't walk. And so there's jokes about that. And, my, you know, it's like, oh, Anna, she's, you know, she's, she's not great with pain. Um, and it really wasn't until I gave birth to both of my kids um, and my mom was in, in the room for one of them that she really realized, like, 
whoa, you really can handle pain in a way that I didn't even know. And what I told her was, oh, that labor pain felt like my period every month. You know, like that's how I always Mm. have felt, if not, you know, worse than that. So I could manage the contractions, which were really incredibly painful. And after, you know, 17 hours, I was, I'd sort of tapped out, but for 17 hours of contractions every two minutes, and these were contractions on Pitocin and Cytotec and these drugs that make your, your contractions way worse than sort of like natural contractions because you're being induced. Um, And I was kind of like, I mean, it wasn't easy, but I, I could handle it because this was sort of what my life felt like so much of the time. So Okay, I went on a tangent, wow. but stop me and let's re. <laughs> no, it's regroup. not. Yeah, that. Yeah, wow. I I think I I want to highlight on something because I think it's so common among those that suffer with endo is one. This is sort of considered an invisible disease, right? And the main measurement is is pain, and we know that pain as professionals. I don't think inherently we know this. You know, pain is experience so differently among individuals based on their experiences and and so many factors and being through this month after month after month since you know most people 12 13 years old or so they they do have this concept and they ask their I hear this a lot in my patients like I guess I just you know have a low pain tolerance but then on the other hand I think once they understand what's going on they're like oh no I actually have a high pain tolerance and it's it's so unfortunate that it takes something like even a family member to see you going through what they have experienced and to relate that in their own way to, oh my gosh, I've experienced that and this is not easy. Therefore, you know, oh, your pain is real now because they have some, I guess, reference point for their own life. And I think that's really important to highlight for many of these people dealing with endometriosis. And I do want to ask a a Mm follow-up question um, just both from a personal insight as well as as your professional um, thoughts. I want to highlight the disparities, not just among women with endometriosis, but those that have endometriosis and have, you know, low income status or are not white. Do you... Do you feel that there are specific societal or cultural factors that contribute to these mental health disparities and disparities in healthcare among women's health? Well, there's, I mean, the level of racism that's inherent in all of these systems, including, and very much so within the mental health system. Um, I think, and in particular, Black women are sort of seen as not experiencing pain or having a much higher pain tolerance. Not just Black women, but Black women have the, the worst they have the worst, they receive the worst care in all of these areas by far, you know, by far, but Native American women, Latina women, Asian women as well, but it is especially terrible um, for black women. So I want to make sure to highlight that. And yes, I mean, the, the amount of times that they are sort of um, written off as drug seeking um, or, you know, able to tolerate pain at, at levels that's just completely abnormal, like nobody would be able to tolerate um, is one thing, but then you also, I mean, and it's easy for people to think, well, um, when that intersects with lower income, um, and lower education, et cetera, that's probably worse. Sure. But then you look at cases like Serena Williams, Beyonce Knowles, who both nearly died in childbirth. Um, you start to realize like that this is, you know, something that's happening for black women just across the board. And sometimes even you could have a doctorate or, you know, um, be, you know, as famous as Beyonce or Serena Williams, and that won't help you or protect you. Um, so you can imagine how it'll be for women that have not had access to the resources that so many other, uh, you know, so many women like you and I have, um, education, et cetera. And, and thinking about that, I mean, look at you and, and I, Jandra, I mean, we have like very high education, we have privilege, we have access to a lot of specialists and resources and knowledge. And look how long it took for us to be taken seriously and get diagnosed properly. I mean, I am 40. I'm 40 years old. And I have been struggling with something since 13, easily. 
and have been, you know, being loud about it since 30. So for 10 years, and definitely longer, in my opinion, but but 10 years for sure, where I was like, I stating the words endometriosis and being told, no, it's just your period. Um, I mean, it's, that's the part that has made me feel like, all right, I need to be on a megaphone as often as I possibly can, because if this is happening to me, right, and I, you know, have worked in these settings, I know, I know things, I have access to research, I know how to read research, I, I know how to understand it compared, you know, compared to the general population, probably a lot better than, you know, many or most, and even still could not be taken seriously. So that is insane to me. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, that's why we're here. And, and I think that the more people that can, we can reach, even if it's one additional person, I, I think that that's worth it. And it, it, it does need to change because this is a reality and it's, it is ridiculous. And to be, for me, I share a little bit in the first episode of this about it just being in the, honestly, the prime position, right? I see people coming in with this diagnosis. I have resources to refer them to and, and several actually, not just one person. I'm not in a rural mm -hmm. place where there's no help. It's just, it, it was ridiculous and how long it took. And then to see things like, okay, you know, one in 10, and there is no real uh, difference in, in different cultures and different races in how this disease impacts women or those with endometriosis, but the care is significantly different, especially for women of color. And, it, and when we only rely on pain as this reference point because everything is normal and it takes right now surgery to find that how we need to really change the narrative and in, in listening to our patients i think some studies even say history just taking a good history is pretty predictive of endometriosis being there i think that is something we can change in healthcare is just believing our patients and giving them at minimum, the benefit of the doubt that something is actually wrong and it it may not show up on a test, but that also requires, you know, the right person to know what they're looking for. And th there's so many steps in between that, but I think just believing your patient and, and maybe admitting just, you know, I, I believe you, I'm not sure how right. I can help you is a very different conversation than saying nothing is wrong with you because I, as a professional don't know right. what I don't know. Well, and it's tricky, right? I mean, this, we could go, we could have, you know, a whole podcast dedicated just to like racism and misogyny within healthcare, right? I mean, we look at the lack of research done on just women's health, um, you know, the lack of, um, you know, studies, including, you know, diverse populations and, you know, um, I mean, first women, but then also just, you know, across the races, right? Like that these, the studies aren't there. And so, yes, of course, in medication is going to be impacted differently on different bodies, right? I mean, that's, uh, I could, I, <laughs> I'm so full of rage <laughs> that um, sometimes it's hard for me. If you get me started on, on something in this topic, it's hard for me to sort of stay focused. Cause what I'm realizing is that you'd sort of asked me like, how did you even get diagnosed? And we haven't even begun to like get into that story, which is also a long winded story and a frustrating one. Um, but an important one because it's not unique to me. It is just the classic story. And my story is probably far less severe than so many that are out there, um, which is the other reason that I feel so inclined to to like talk when, uh, whenever someone gives me a platform. I'm like, give me your platform. Let me talk. <laughs> I've got things to say. <laughs> yes, please. Well, can you tell us about that after years of, you know, just – kind of witnessing what you're seeing and and comparing that mm -hmm. to your experience. Um, tell us about your your journey to yeah, diagnosis. So um, after I finished my fellowship, I uh, I was married kind of right at the tail end of that and we began trying to have a baby, you know, right away. Um, and I could not get pregnant, could not get pregnant, could not get pregnant. 
Um, so I think about a year into that really frustrating process, I went to my OBGYN in, here in San Diego and I said, I, I'm convinced I have endometriosis. I have like all the symptoms. Nobody's taking me seriously, you know, um, and I can't get pregnant. So she, so I will, so I will give her this one credit <laughs> and then I will not credit her with anything else that's positive. Um, and I have a lot of anger now against this doctor where for many years I held her on a pedestal because she was the first to believe me. So it's really hard, right? Cause it, it felt so nice to be believed and taken seriously. And for someone to do the surgery needed to sort of diagnose endo, which is right. A laparoscopic, la <laughs> good grief, laparoscopic surgery. Um, and she also just created a lot more problems for me. And what she should have done was say, I'm not an expert in this. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Let me send you to another doctor who does, and they can do the surgery and also do the treatment for you. Um, but she did do the surgery. She believed me, grateful for that. I found out I had endometriosis. Um, and, and sort of that was that. But her, she didn't touch it. She didn't do anything, which now I'm sort of like, well, thank God she didn't. Um, but also she went in there and just created a lot more pain and inflammation for me. I mean, recovering from that surgery, which was really just a laparoscopy to this surgery where I've had like literal organs removed and a ton of excision. And I feel 10,000 times better after this surgery than I did that one. That one took me a long time to feel better and recover. And it was some of the worst pain I'd ever felt in my life. So, okay, I'm getting off track again. So basically she does the surgery, tells me, you look great. You have mild endo. Your uterus is, quote, beautiful. That's what she said. And, you know, everything else is fine. Um, it's better we don't touch it or it'll impact your fertility. Your fallopian tubes are clear. Great, I thought. So I just kept trying to get pregnant. Kept trying, kept trying. Nothing was happening. Could not get pregnant. So I went to a reproductive endocrinologist and um, we started... IUI, right? Intrauterine insemination. I did four rounds of that, could not get pregnant. At that point, and I give this doctor credit for this, he discovered, which is rare via ultrasound, adenomyosis on my uterus. My uterus is retroverted. They will tell you that that's like a any or an Audi belly button. That is not true. I have now since learned that if you have a retroverted uterus, that, that is probably a red flag. Maybe not always, but I think, and I'll let you speak more to that, Jandra, because that's outside the scope of my practice. But as I understand it now, that is not normal. Um, so I had a retroverted uterus and I had like a spot on my uterus somewhere that he he suspected was adenomyosis. I had never heard that word before, had an MRI and confirmed adenomyosis. So, so at that point, we do IVF. I thankfully get pregnant. I then get pregnant again, um, and, you know, a year later. Now I have my two babies. Great. So after my second baby, he just turned two a couple weeks ago, um, I had told myself, I am going to dedicate this year to my health and I want to get better. Um, so I had gone, well, let me, okay, let me back up. I had heard about Nancy's Nook um, on Facebook probably a couple years into my infertility stuff. And this was after my surgery. So I kind of started learning things and realizing, oh, my doctor is not saying things that are accurate, such as pregnancy cures it. And once you're pregnant, it'll go away. Or once you are in menopause, you know, it'll go away. And I started to learn all of that wasn't true. And that's when I started to have a lot of doubt in my doctor and thinking, wait a minute, maybe I was told something wrong here. But I still sort of assumed what she had seen on my surgery. I mean, I figured, like, she knows what a uterus is supposed to look like and fallopian tubes and all that. So I sort of figured I was in the clear in, in regards to that. Um, as it turns out, that's not true. And I found a doctor in L.A. Uh, there wasn't anyone in San Diego on Nancy's Nook. Um, so Nancy's Nook is, is one... Uh, place where people have sometimes found uh, helpful resources and recommendations. At that time, it was really the only place that I knew of to go to. Um, and I think at the time, it might have been really the only sort of like evidence-based place to go, where the whole uh, notion concept is do your own research, we have the research here for you, read it, and show up to your appointments prepared to advocate for yourself. And also, here's a list of doctors that we approve 
that we call nook specialists that, you know, can do these surgeries and, you know, hopefully cure you or, you know, get you on the path to that. Right. Great. So I looked at the list, no one in San Diego. So I go to LA, see a woman there. It was a very positive experience for me um, in that, I mean, I literally left that appointment and drove, what, two and a half hours home, and I just cried the whole way home, but it was happy tears because it was the first time that somebody, like, really understood what was going on with my body, and I felt in, like, I was in really good hands. So she noted, you know, your uterus is enormous, your cervix is, everything's pulled to the left, Um, you know, you've got some serious stuff happening sort of, like, behind your she looked at my surgery photos, let me say that. And she said, wow, this is, you know, pretty severe case, actually. And you have a ton of it sort of um, in the pouch of Douglas, right, which is like behind the vaginal canal and t- help me out, Chandra, <laughs> between the rectum and the vaginal canal. right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, this is why I went into mental health. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so I was like, okay, I have a plan. And um, she said, you're going to need to do pelvic floor therapy, which I was kind of like, oh, groan. That what a waste of time. Um, because, you know, I just I had done it in the past and it was fine, but it didn't feel helpful. So I thought, well, I'm having trouble postpartum, like pee in my pants every time I like, you know, breathe. So I might as well just, you know, see if this person can help me. And she said, you have to see Jandra Mueller. She's the best. And I looked, and Jandra, that's you, clearly, up in Encinitas, like 45 minutes from where I live. I was like, fine, I'll do it. If this is the best, I'm only going to the best. I'm not going to bother with anything, you know, less than the best. So then Jandra and I meet. And uh, I will cry, probably. Um, Okay, well, now I'm crying, which is annoying, because everyone's like, oh, God, these idiots. (laughs) Um, Yes. I mean, completely like changed the course of my life. So, uh, did, did a few sessions of pelvic floor therapy and by the way, like completely removed the whole like incontinence thing from like my life, just from the postpartum. I didn't even, I mean, it was like magic because I really didn't do anything at home on my own ladies. Like if you're paying, go to Jandra or wherever you live in the, you know, go, go see your pelvic floor therapist. They are amazing. Um, and it works, but, um, I also started to learn a ton about my body, a ton about so many things that I just didn't know anything about. I had sort of, you know, discounted as like being important or or just didn't didn't know what I didn't even know, right? And then you started to teach me so many things. Um, I learned at that point too from, which by the way, Jandra's a specialist in SIBO as well, but I found out from this other doctor that I had likely had um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO is what that stands for. Um, met with a doctor, a gastroenterologist, and, uh, and got treated for that. And I won't talk about SIBO because I really can't talk about SIBO, but I know it's very, <laughs> there's a high comorbidity in endometriosis patients. Um, there's a lot of comorbidities. That's one that I happen to have. Um, and anyhow, that's that. So, oh, and that's a whole topic we will cover will later on in, in one Sorry, episode. So because, yes, yes, because it is a lot. So, no, not to interrupt yeah, you. So, yes. um, yes. Yeah, so then I uh, found out that my surgery would be, um, it's all, this doctor does not take insurance, which I knew going in. But I don't think I really understood. <laughs> I think I was, I was like, I'll figure that out. And I'm sure my insurance will cover a lot of it or whatever. Turns out that's not really the case. My surgery was going to be $33,000 two weeks prior to the scheduled surgery. Um, you know, I had to pay that right out of pocket. Um, and that's not including all the hospital bills I was going to have to pay, et cetera. It probably would have cost me somewhere around forty grand, maybe more. I'm not so sure. Um which I realized at that point I was screwed. You know, I remember calling my husband. I pulled over to the side of the road crying and my husband's solution was, well, we'll sell our house, which again, lucky we even have the, you know, privilege to be able to say something like that and have that as an option or have parents that we could call and and ask, you know, for a loan or something. But the fact that that was the only option was really icky to me. Because again, how many people are actually able to even do this then? There's only a small subset of the population that can get care for this. That's insane. When one out of 10 women that we know of suffer from this, I mean, that's not, that's not sustainable. That's not okay. And so 
that's when I found out about Dr. Spring Robinson here in San Diego. And um, she does take insurance, and that's who did my surgery. Um, when she looked at my surgery photos from 2016, she, in other words, essentially said, can I cuss on this? No, better know that I don't. I won't. Holy poop, she said. <laughs> um, but she didn't actually say that. Um, and she said, you know, this is severe stage four, deep infiltrating endo. Um, you're at risk of losing your rectum and needing rectal reconstruction surgery. I want to get you into surgery right away. Um, she tried to schedule me like two weeks later, or a week later, which I, I couldn't do, but they put me on the calendar for like my birthday. I remember it was like April 12th and I'm like, I cannot, um, be there for that. I'm turning 40. So I want to do that. Um, but she said my uterus was, you know, 10 times the size that it was supposed to be, that it was like covering my fallopian tubes. Right. So enter the rage part of the situation, because again, remember, you know, infertility for all these years, trying, thinking that I was told my uterus was great. My fallopian tubes were fabulous. None of which was true. Um, and the infertility piece, I mean, I kind of just glossed right over that, but I mean, I could do a whole podcast on that. I mean, that was some of the most painful time of my life. It still makes me cry if I let myself think about it. And I still have a hard time hearing about people's pregnancies that are just sort of like spontaneous, like, oh, yay, you know, we just had sex and then we got pregnant because we wanted to. And, you know, that's still painful, even though I have my babies, everything's good. I, you know, um, that's how, how impactful infertility is. So, there is so much, um, there's so much anger right now. And it's, it's strange because it's mixed with this like enormous sense of relief and empowerment. My body feels incredible, even though I'm like recovering from really major surgery. Um, and I know there's going to be side effects of that that aren't going to be fun for me that I'm going to have to navigate. But, um, yeah, I'm sort of a jumbled mix of a lot of things. And, I'm hanging on to the rage because that rage is really important. Um, and I don't want to jump to, oh, I'm just relieved and happy because I want that rage to continue to motivate me to fight for other women. Um, so that's kind of my story. The mental health aspect of going through fertility mm -hmm. treatments, not just the hormone aspect, but living with endometriosis, but also just your experience with doing hormonal therapy for IVF mm -hmm. in having endometriosis, because mm -hmm. I don't think that that's often explained. You know, it just seems like this is what you do, but there's so much behind Response. that and how your body. Yeah. Feels. And I think I'm still unpacking part two of that question in my mind. There's so much that I'm unpacking that I feel like we're probably going to need to do like a part two and a part three with me somewhere down the line where I can sort of go back and say, actually, um, I thought about this and I have a different answer to that. But um, I'll, I'll do my best to answer that um, from how I understand it today. As far as just the, yeah, the impact of infertility, I mean, remember that I was essentially told, like, you're not infertile because of endometriosis. I mean, I was basically told your endometriosis is so minor um, that that's not what's causing it. So I went into my infertility treatment just thinking, like, there was something just wrong with me. And, um, oof. I guess I've never said this out loud. I felt like, yeah, like maybe, um, like I just wasn't supposed to like have a baby, you know, right? That like, it just like, wasn't meant for me. Um, and that that was like some sort of sign of that or like punishment. Um, and it wasn't until I got the diagnosis of adenomyosis that that shifted for me. Cause then I realized, see, there is something wrong and that's why I can't get pregnant. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so I, I think the impact of infertility just in general, it is such a painful, lonely process, um, full of, uh, the support that you get is, is just loaded with platitudes and silver linings. And a lot of people saying, it's going to work for you. It's going to work for you. Instead of telling you, I hope it works for you. I want it to work for you. Because it's going to work for you isn't helpful because nobody can say that. My own, you know, RE couldn't tell me that with certainty, right? Um, and it's just a lot of hope and despair on repeat every 30 days. Hope and despair, hope and despair. And like having to hold on to hope 
when you are just like living in despair is like an impossible thing to ask women to do. And somehow they continue to do it. Um, and then you're going through a lot of these painful procedures and there's not a lot of good answers, or maybe you're getting mixed messages or different opinions and it's hard to know what to do. And then you're on crazy hormones and those hormones can make you just a really (laughs) ugly human being. Um, (laughs) you know, it's just because you're not you. Um, but that's also the case with endo, right? I mean, endo on its own does a lot of wonky things with your hormones. I, I learned very recently um, that I have like essentially very little to no testosterone, which is an important hormone that you need to have a libido. Well, <laughs> I did not have a libido and I thought that there was just something wrong with me. Um, and there was, it was that I don't have any freaking testosterone, but nobody in the course of all these years thought to say, let's test your hormones, little lady. Let's see what's going on over there. Um, and I heard from Dr. Spring Robinson that that is due to the endo, right? Cause the endo creates so much estrogen and it depletes the testosterone and gender. You can please correct me if I've botched that in any way. Um, but that's how I sort of understood that, that consultation. Um, so I'll let you take over. It may not be so much just to just do to endometriosis, but I, I think what we do know about testosterone is, for one, it's one of the first hormones to start to drop down, even in our 30s, um, as we transition into perimenopause, although we could be years and years away from menopause. But we do know that certain medications that are used for or as first line therapies for endometriosis, like birth control pills can have a negative impact on testosterone. And I think this is a huge area that's being explored more by more sexual health experts and physicians in this field. And I I think we'll know more about it in the years to come. There are people, thankfully, that are looking at this. But yeah, it's it's another one of those, you know, women's health issues that testosterone is not for women. But we at any point in our cycle should have actually more testosterone than estrogen, which I don't think a lot of people understand. And something, Mm -hmm. if it's okay, if I share this, um, one thing that you had shared with me when we were talking about sexual dysfunction and, you know, one of the questions I always ask people and it's on our form is, you know, any issues with sex and some people will put pain. Some people don't put anything. I think it makes them uncomfortable to talk about, But when we started having that conversation, you had asked me a very honest question and said, you know, is it just that I'm asexual or can people just be asexual? Yeah, well, the way that actually went down, well, because obviously I definitely believe in asexuality as as a, you know, uh, uh, sexual identity. So I know that it exists. I just sort of had put myself in that category to some extent, but with some caveats where I just sort of had said, I think that I am asexual because I, I fit most of the criteria seemingly, um, but it never quite fit for me. It just, I was like trying to fit myself in this box because I just wanted to have an answer. And so when I said that to you, it was more like, uh, eh, I think I'm just, I think I just am. And I just need to accept that. And I just need to explore that more and understand that better and maybe do some therapy about it and figure it out. Um, and I had kind of just been okay with that because I just this has been my experience for so much of my life that I was kind of like oh whatever maybe I just don't ever need to have sex and maybe that's just fine even though it's definitely not and I'm sure my husband would be like excuse me what's the what are we planning here without my consent um so I then you then said to me sure maybe you are and that's totally fine if you are also maybe you just get your hormones checked. And you started teaching me about these different hormones. And I said to you, oh, yeah, but they check all those things when I go through IVF and stuff. And you're like, "Mm -hmm. probably not the ones they're supposed to check around this. And I'm like, okay. And you had not been wrong about anything else. So I was like, well, fine, like, I'll, I'll go get it checked. I don't have anything else to do. Why not? You know, I love that I just said I don't have anything else to do. I have two children and the cur- <laughs> But anyways, I figured, sure, let me prioritize me this year, right? That's the goal. So I went to Dr. Alyssa Yee, who is here in San Diego, also phenomenal. And yeah, she, she it was another incredible experience. I felt so heard, so validated. And she also was like, yeah, girl, let's tech your hormones. Let's see what's going on before we like start labeling ourselves things that we're not sure that we are. I'm like, great, let's do it. Yeah, sure enough, you know, 
and I, again, really bad at speaking to the results of these things because I, it's not my world and I don't understand it and I don't pretend to, but she explained and I sort of listened and tried to follow her in terms of everything that was going on with my hormones. But essentially what I found out was that my hormones are, um, the hormones that I need to like be, you know, a healthy functioning sexual being are just not, you know, at the levels they're supposed to be at. And so we are now addressing that. Um, to add to the anger and rage, one of the things that I'm supposed to be on is like a vaginal testosterone cream. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is not uh, covered by insurance because it is not FDA approved because testosterone is not FDA approved for women. So I am angry about that as well because this is another one of those, well, I can afford to do it and pay it out of pocket. And also, so many people cannot, and that is not okay because sexual, healthy sexual functioning, um, I have lost at least a decade or more of my life in terms of that. Um, but I'm not, I'm not willing to lose any more time in that department. I want to get better there and feel better. And it makes me sick that that's something that is going to be denied to so many women when we give men Viagra that are like 99 years old and more power to them. I think any, I'm not being an ageist, like have sex till you die until you're like 703 years old. Like I support that, but let's make that available to everybody, not just men. Anyways, off my soapbox, back to Jandra. Yes. So let's talk about this a little bit because it is very relevant for those with endometriosis. And there are some studies looking at sexual functioning and the impact of those with endometriosis on sexual functioning. And so we think about one of the clinical manifestations of endometriosis is dyspnea or painful intercourse. But I think that is also just very limiting because it's not just about having pain or the lack thereof. It's about desire and arousal and connection and intimacy. And you can have pleasurable intercourse without orgasm because there's a drive of that connection. So it doesn't sure. always have to be about the orgasm, but of, of course that's very yeah. beneficial for both both partners, but it's not the entire picture of it. And there are a few studies that look at just sexual function overall and the impact of arousal and desire, lubrication, not just pain. And there is a huge issue in those with endometriosis compared to controls or, or those without endometriosis. And studies have shown that multidisciplinary care, including proper excision of the lesions, not only can impact and improve pain, but also has an impact in, in improving arousal desire. And there's, a, I'm sure, a huge psychological component to that. Again, not that it's in your head. Mm -hmm. There are physiologic responses that come from that. But as a as a mental health therapist, you know, do you talk with your patients about? I do, sex and, um, and that's something I, I don't. I, I don't think I was as good about doing that earlier on in my career, but I think more recently that's something that I have been more mindful of, especially given my own experiences with this in my own therapy, where I either had my therapists. Um, you know, I, I had a couple male therapists early on when I first started going to therapy as a master's student. That was kind of not a requirement, but like a strong recommendation. So that's when I first really went to therapy. Um, and it was more just like an exploratory, like, oh, I'm just going to therapy, you know, just to be therapized for the sake of it. Um, but of course, a lot was sort of uncovered in that little uh, experiment that I did. And that therapist who I love and adore um, could not talk to me about sex. I tried to bring this stuff up because I was worried about it. I was already noticing like I, my desire is really low and yeah, it's very painful and something's wrong, but I just, he, he just really would change the subject. Couldn't really go there with me. And I think it's because he probably had some like fatherly instinct towards me or something. Like I reminded him of like uh, maybe his daughter, if he had one, I don't know, or somebody in his life, right? We call that countertransference, transference and countertransference within therapy. Um, and, you know, I tried to talk through some other things in my therapy and with different providers and it just, it never really amounted to anything helpful. I wasn't really asked about. And, um, I even went, my husband and I went to couples therapy for this exact 
reason. Like we really have tried, like we've wanted to improve. We've, we've, this is something we both really care about. Um, but we're just sitting on opposite sides of the spectrum of it. Right. And so, um, we went to a supposed expert in this and not helpful at all. And not once did this person suggest let's, why don't you go get your hormones tested by somebody or give me names of anybody? Or why don't you go to pelvic floor therapy? I mean, it wasn't even on her list of recommendations, which I think would be like a first place to start before you're going to dive into the psychological stuff. I mean, there really isn't a whole lot there psychologically, thankfully, in my case, it's, and that can be the case, you know, there, there could be sexual trauma or things like that that people have experienced, which adds to, right, like the layers of stuff to work through. It's not the case for me, thankfully. Um, and also have had really lovely experiences with, you know, relationships. I've been in only loving relationships, um, had very sweet boyfriends. Um, I, I don't feel like that is an area of trauma for me sort of in any way. Other than that, I have felt like something is seriously wrong with me that I just don't want to, um, that I want to want to, but I can't. Right. Um, and that's been the main thing, but the, the, in terms of mental health stuff, these providers, I mean, my field is also failing significantly. Unless you go see someone with expertise in this, you're probably not going to get a lot of help. And sometimes you might go to someone with supposed expertise and they clearly don't have it because this person was like unhelpful. You know, they weren't just not helpful. They were like the opposite. They were like unhelpful. I feel like they created more problems. Um, so, Yeah. And I want to highlight something you said too, and just for anyone listening, you know, this is, people have their own personal journeys with this and there are many factors that are relevant for some and not others. It It is more complex than just hormones and just your psychological state or just anxiety, things like that. But the issue comes when it's distressing to you. And that's where the problem lies because of course, like you mentioned earlier, are people asexual and can they be like that? And is that okay? Absolutely. The The issue when it comes to sexual dysfunction is not having all of the information, number one. So you're only working with what you know. So you are fitting yourself into a box. But then the second issue really is, is, is this distressing to you? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something to ask yourself. If you, listening, are experiencing some sort of sexual dysfunction or or have hopes like maybe something's wrong with me. Is there information out there? There is, and there are great providers, um, though far and few between. Uh, hopefully that changes in the next 10 years. But just know that if it's distressing for you, keep going and keep advocating for yourself to get answers. A hundred percent. And I mean, I can't tell you the amount of times that people told me, not people, doctors, um, just, you just need to relax. I hate that word now. <laughs> if anyone tells me to relax, they should run because I, as, especially when you deal with infertility, that word is like the number one terrible word. Um, but the amount of providers that encourage me to drink, to, you know, overcome what they perceived as like anxiety. I didn't have anxiety about having sex. There was no reason to have anxiety. It wasn't like, there wasn't anything that made me scared. It was, I mean, there was pain and there was, you know, my body was definitely guarding against like pain. And clearly there was going to be pain because the majority of my endo, as I've now found out, was centralized right behind where my cervix is, which is right like where penetration happens, right? So of course that was going to be painful. But to your point, um, it wasn't necessarily always painful. It wasn't always pain that was the the deciding factor in me sort of not being into it it was just like I couldn't get my brain there um despite really wanting to or it was very it was like it required you know like magic tricks <laughs> to get me to be like in the mood it was like oh okay we'll we'll get there but it's gonna be a journey <laughs> you know um so anyhow um yes I think get answers is to, to sum up your point <laughs> your very valid point get answers because they are there. You just have to, you know, if somebody doesn't listen to you or discounts you, then that's not the doctor for you, whether that's a mental health professional or other otherwise, right? Go see someone else. Absolutely. And I'm excited for, you know, part two to hear all about your journey after recovery and how things are. Um, so I definitely think we should do a part two interview with you and kind of catch up on all these things that 
you're going, mm-hmm. you're undergoing current treatments for. So how does that look in, you know, six months, nine months, a year or so? Um, so what, what advice could you give, again, both professionally and personally for anyone that has endometriosis to advocate for their mental health needs, uh, their physical needs in the healthcare system, navigating this and ensuring that oh, their concerns gosh. are taken well, seriously? Well, listen, I think that there is, well, first of all, I'd be listening to things like this podcast, right, which shares evidence-based information. Um, the doctors that are listed in I Care, I Care Better, um, those are doctors that have been approved, right? They have shown like expert excision skills. You probably need excision surgery if you're being told otherwise. It's not necessarily completely wrong, but I would continue to explore that and find a doctor, you know, that does specialize in this. My actual big fear, I have less concerns about the people that are like, my doctor's a jerk or discounted me or was, you know, because they're likely not going to go back to that person. I'm more worried about my friends and family that have the really sweet doctor that they love. Oh, I've gone to so-and-so for 10 years. They delivered my babies. I love them. They're so sweet. I'm more worried about those friends and those patients and that family because they're not going to leave that doctor who I know doesn't know anything about endometriosis or adenomyosis or fibroids or a whole lot of other stuff that might be going on with their bodies. And with endo and adenomyosis and all these other things that I named, there's tons of comorbidities. There's other diseases and things that I haven't even listed because I don't even know about them. I don't want to talk about them because they're not, you know, I don't, I can't speak to them, but I'm sure you will. And they'll be covered on this podcast. Um, So I think if you have a nice doctor, that's great. Go to them for your annual pap smear. Um, If you have like a UTI or something, maybe go there. But if you, for your endometrial, if you suspect you have endo, if you see yourself in any of these stories, in any of these checklists, you're not crazy. You are not just anxious. You are anxious because you're in pain. You're not in pain because you're anxious, right? So go advocate for yourself. And one thing I will say, okay, right? So I'm, you know, people call me Dr. Anna, Dr. Anna Arteaga Biggs. I have the words doctor in front of my name. So As a psychologist, one might think, well, you're a psychologist, so you know everything about mental health, so I can go to you for anything. No, you cannot go to me for anything. There's tons of mental health related things that you should never go to me for because I don't know enough about them or in some cases really anything about them other than one line in a textbook that I read uh, 10 years ago that I don't barely remember, right? And so there are things that, we ex- that we're experts in and there are things that we are not. And we need to know, we as clinicians need to know when to say, I don't know enough about that. I'm going to send you to my colleague or to this person who I know does know amazing things about that. And they are really well skilled or researched or knowledgeable or all the things in this department. Um, and I think that's important, right? When you're seeking care and mental health, don't go to your normal therapist that you talk to about whatever you talk to about to talk about your endometriosis because chances are they're not going to know what they need to know about that or they're going to know misinformation. Maybe they have endo, but they didn't, they don't know what they don't know yet. Like me, I didn't know. I mean, if somebody saw me 10 years ago or five years ago, even, and were talking to me about endo, I was probably going to give them misinformation at the same misinformation I was being given. So I don't know if I have like a good sort of to wrap this up, but I will just say, you know, there are experts in these things and that's who you should seek out when you can. If you cannot, then go armed into your appointments. Go with the the research that you're getting. Show this to your provider. If you have a sweet doctor, and these are Jandra's words, so I'm just going to quote you, maybe they'll change. If they're a good person, maybe they'll hear you and they'll hear your story and then they'll be motivated to do better for the next patient. So it's okay to continue to collab with them, but that's maybe not who you should, you know, be trusting with your body and your care. Yeah. So I think to summarize kind of things that I hear you saying too is, you know, it's okay that you have a doctor that you like that takes care of many of your needs. It's also okay that you go and see somebody more specialized in that area. It does not make your current doctor a bad doctor or we are all human. We have outside lives outside of our, you know, professions. And 
And simply stated, some physicians, they don't have an interest in this, or it's not within their kind of scope as a PCP. They may know a little bit about it, but it it's okay as long as you understand, I'm here for this, for you, and it's okay that I go outside. And any, I think any practitioner that cares for their patients, they understand that too. And they really ultimately want to help you. And I, I am a true believer that it's worth it to try to bring these things up, right? I think when we don't, how do those people know that they don't know something? And I'm sure that there are situations where you're going to find somebody who really, they don't change their mind and they keep doing what they're doing. But I do truly believe at, when people go into healthcare, many sure. people and probably the large majority want to help people. And sometimes we as patients have to help them along and kind of show them in a very, in a professional and respectful way. Like, you know, there was a piece missing. And so I don't know, I, th I think that there's probably differing opinions about that, but that's my belief. And um, I hope that in doing that and doing this podcast and having patients and professionals share their insights and mm -hmm. stories. I hope so too. Hopefully that will change. And I think that you doing this podcast is really going to help change this area of women's health significantly. So I just can't state in any, I don't know. I just, I'm so grateful for you. I know you've heard me say that a lot, <laughs> um, but I feel like I need to say it publicly as well because you are incredible. So helpful. Well, I so appreciate that. And so appreciate you sharing your story and insights, both as someone going through this, just having had surgery, but also somebody who works in this field and can kind of step aside and and take a look at like, wow, I, I didn't know this, not just for myself, but also for my patients. And to hear the anger and rage I, and, and being put in a positive way, I think is is so helpful and so important. So we thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story. Um, anything else you want to add or yeah, if you're well, if you're in California, I can see anyone in California via telehealth or in person. Um, my website is drartiagabiggs.com. Um, so you can find me that way. And um, yeah. And we'll put everything in the show notes. And we thank you very much for listening. Thank you so and much. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged, presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on our website, iCareBetter.com, or social media platforms at iCareBetter. And let's continue this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis.